Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we've got a live stream going, a free range conversation with American Farmland Trust. Um, for those that uh, have been aware of these free range conversations in the past, they've usually been tele-town halls um, where we've had our president, John Piatti, kind of leading a phone call with people asking questions, but we decided to start doing live streams, bring people in um, and have them be able to engage directly with our wonderful staff. So today uh, we've got a conversation with our Women for the Land staff about the future of women in agriculture. So I'm really excited to, to introduce Dr. Gabrielle Roche McNally and Caitlin Joseph, two of our Women for the Land staff members, and I'm gonna let them take it away, tell them a little bit about themselves. Um, but before we start, just to let you know about how we're going to do this today, if you have any questions or comments at all, um, please just type them into the, the comment thread on whatever platform you're viewing this on, and we'll do our best to get to all of them today, answer all of your burning questions about the future of women. So, um, Gabrielle, do you want to start with you? Talk to us a little bit about how you came to this work with, with women in agriculture. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Greg. It's great to be here and nice to be here with all of you who are joining us, although we, we won't see your faces, but we feel your presence. Uh, so, you know, I was thinking about this um, earlier this morning, and, you know, I think the, the big thing that's kind of drawn me is both kind of professional and personal threads. So uh, professionally, I have been studying food systems uh, and um, agriculture for pretty much my entire adult life. So um, it started out working in sub-Saharan Africa and Zambia and Ethiopia, exploring food insecurity and food sovereignty among mostly women smallholder farmers. Um, and I did that as an undergrad uh, many years ago now. And it really sort of fed my desire to understand how people feed themselves, how people um, secure their environment, um, how they find and access sort of power and influence through sort of this basic sort of effort of feeding themselves in their community. And that work has kind of continued as a thread as I have worked through grad school and trying to understand how we kind of get multiple benefits off of managed land. So how do we give land managers uh, money to make sure that they're doing more than just sort of looking out for the bottom economic bottom line. Um, and, and in my PhD, I did a lot of work um, thinking about how sort of climate change is going to impact farmers uh, and what responses they are going to take um, and actions they're going to take to um, respond to climate disruption in their operations. So, you know, that's sort of the kind of impetus from a professional point of view, but always within that space, um, recognizing how important women were in that conversation. But to be honest, in a lot of sort of the history of the research that I've been involved in has been very male centric. Like there's been an assumption that it's a sort of white man behind the tractor. Um, and so as I started to kind of pull the veil back and read um, amazing work from Carolyn Sachs and Dr. Angela Carter and Jean Eels, all these wonderful women who have been writing and working in this space, um, uh, Women Food and Ag Network, who kind of helped to sort of shine a light on some of these things as American Farmland Trust was building our program. And so um, all of that made me recognize how important we have to sort of center women's voices and all women's voices in this work. And then just really quickly, kind of from the personal perspective, you know, I grew up not in an agricultural setting, but um, my sort of biggest memories are sort of picking berries and putting up food with my grandmother and seeing how women are often at the center of that kind of community and home, food security, food preparation, and that cut ties to the kitchen garden. And I think all of those pieces sort of inspired me in doing this work and pursuing a way to hopefully support um, all women in agriculture. So it's safe to say that this is not just a job at AFT and the Women for the Land Initiative. These are issues that are, are very personal and that you're very passionate about. Yes, safe to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caitlin, how about you? Caitlin's our Women for the Land Outreach Coordinator. So she's on the ground working with women farmers and landowners all across the country. Uh, Caitlin, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to this work. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And um, Gabrielle's uh, work and, and path to, to this um, point is really uh, compelling to me. And, and also mine has been a bit different. Um, I've been um, less involved in kind of the, the research side of things, I'd say, throughout my career, although that has been um, a thread at points. Um, 
But for myself, I really started out um, kind of like Gabrielle, you know, getting galvanized when I was an undergraduate around kind of this intersection between um, food production and environmental impacts and kind of um, our diet. Um, and I actually, you know, started changing my diet when I was an undergraduate around um, kind of the, the, you know, animal agriculture industry got really interested in kind of pulling on that thread. Um, and that really helped me discover all these kind of cultural implications of uh, your diet as well. And, you know, started talking to folks from many different backgrounds about kind of um, what their food culture is and how that influences the way that they think about that environment um, and food intersection. And just recognize that there's, you know, a need in this kind of work um, and activism around the food system to um, ensure that we're meeting people where they are and um, you're really incorporating the people component of this work. Um, and so that's definitely been a thread for me throughout. Um, I, I ended up working on multiple farms um, in Michigan um, and kind of pulling from my experience as a, a teacher and educator um, in secondary schools to make that connection in my community. Um, so I've done a lot of work in kind of the farm to school and farm to institution space and making, um, you know, building capacity for regional and uh, local food markets for farmers and, and selling those goods to hospitals and schools and universities. Um, but I've also had kind of this thread throughout my work of uh, sustainable agriculture and, you know, shifting the practice practices on the land that um, that meet people where they are um, in terms of the folks who are managing that land, but also um, ensuring that, uh, like Gabrielle said, the, the land that's being managed is, is benefiting um, folks beyond the farm, um, that there's, you know, those kind of, um, you know, interstitial benefits to, to uh, consumers and uh, the community around the farms. Um, so I would say also that um, that quote that that came up about, uh, you know, the, the man behind the tractor, that was another thing that I think really got me um, interested in, um, you know, this this component of women in in agriculture. Um, when I the first farm I had worked on, you know, I've always been kind of this like tomboy, like I'll arm wrestle the kids at, you know, the middle <laughs> school, you know, uh, like lunch table. And so when I was farming, you know, and I was noticing that a lot of the women that I worked with were being sort of relegated to the herb garden, you know, like they would call us the herb maidens and, um, and the, the tractor and the larger equipment and some of the, just the subtle ways that tasks were sort of split up by gender. Um, and, you know, we had folks join our crew who were gender nonconforming and just talking with them about the, you know, struggles that, that they felt in terms of like finding a place, um, you know, in that sort of subtly reinforced gender breakdown on the farm. Um, so that was something I just really noticed is is still existent and pervasive. And as much as, you know, we've made a lot of progress on um, on these elements in our in our society, I think in agriculture, this this still exists. And um, there's few places that we have to talk about it. So I was really interested in the work that Gabrielle's been doing and building here at AFT. Um, so was excited to join the team back in February. <laughs> and that's a that's an interesting story because I, I grew up working on a farm in Connecticut um, and we had kind of the same division of labor there. Um, one of my best friends um, worked at the farm with me and she was always out picking stat peas, you know, or berries or really delicate things. And, you know, we were always out in the field picking corn, these big heavy bags of 50, 60 pound corn. And one day she was just like, screw that. I can, I can hold a bag of corn, like as well as any of you guys. And she was out there. And I feel like that was just uh, a powerful moment for, for her and the other women working on the farm at the time. So um, very interesting. So, Caitlin, you wrote a blog recently about what uh, you and Gabrielle and the Women for the Land team have kind of learned in this crazy year of 2020. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you've learned in the last year and also a little bit about how those lessons are going to impact you moving forward. And before you do that, I just want to remind everyone that we are taking your questions live. If you have anything you'd like to ask Caitlin or Gabrielle, please just uh, comment it and we'll try and get it. Uh, answered for you during this call today. Caitlin, take it away. Sure. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not sure how many folks have read the blog, but um, the, the, you know, kind of way I've been thinking about this is just the 
the intersections between the issues that we've already been working on were really, I think, just pulled tighter together. You know, like I, I saw these threads of, um, you know, climate change and kind of how we work with farmers on that, um, you know, being pulled closer and closer to the issues around um, land protection and land access, um, you know, generational transfer. Um, you know, I think in terms of the climate change component, um, you know, I, I'm here in Northern California and um, I can tell you, you know, a, a five minute walk outside my front door, you can see houses that were burned to the ground from the wildfires um, this year. And um, our, our own, you know, residence was, was endangered um, in those fires. And so, you know, I, this year, personally being impacted by the, you know, orange skies in the Bay Area. And, um, you know, I know Gabrielle was was experiencing the air quality issues um, for, for many weeks um, this year. I think, you know, thinking of the folks that are out in the fields in, in those conditions um, mm -hmm. is just incredibly heartening. And, you know, just like lights a fire under me around kind of the urgency of, of this issue. And, um, you know, helps, I think, us feel recommitted to um, the work that we're doing as part of the solution to climate change. Um, so, you know, I think just driving that point home for people that this is an issue that is here. It's not something that's in the future. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in terms of, you know, kind of the, the um, social resurgence of folks in the street, you know, kind of raising their own consciousness around um, the racial inequities that are are present um, in all parts of the country, and so many layers there to to talk about. But you know, I think this definitely resonates with our work in terms of um, you know land access, access to resources, access to um, markets. Um, if you are a grower, um, you know, I think there's there's just so much there for us to unpack, and um, I think we. I'm really excited that we, you know, Gabrielle and I are talking about these issues a lot and, and really grappling with, you know, how does it intersect with our work and what is the role um, that AFT can play um, in, you know, this consciousness raising and um, in this, you know, moment where there's an opportunity for us to actually shift these systems. Um, so I think, you know, AFT has a, a really um, important role to play there. Um, yeah. And let me, so let me turn it over to Gabrielle now. I mean, so that, I think that sets the stage really well of all of the things we've learned from this year. Climate change, I think, has reared its head for all of us. Caitlin's in California. Gabrielle is in Oregon. I live in Reno, Nevada. I had full weeks this year where it was only smoke sitting in the valley. It was very hard to breathe. So I think we're, we all felt the impacts of that very, very personally. Um, and so Gabrielle, Caitlin talks about the work of AFT, the work of Women for the Land. So I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the initiative, just what it's about, and maybe what's kind of in store going forward now. <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, yeah, lots, so much to unpack from this year. Um, much of it obviously really difficult, but also really rich, um, and I hope it sort of stays with us as lessons learned since you no, know, I think we can all appreciate that. We hope to get through the pandemic um, in the not too distant future, but I think the vulnerabilities in our food system, the vulnerabilities in some of our communities, also some of the sort of foundations of resilience are embedded there, but I don't think we're gonna, you know, there is a people keep saying, let's go back to normal. And I think we've perhaps left the hut station and we're gonna be sort of revisiting a new place and climate change for sure is going to drive that. But I think we'll continue to see disruptions in our food supply. So how do we continue to pay attention to these things? Uh, so I think there are some exciting pieces. So, you know, backing up for a moment, just to say the initiative, you know, really was born um, in partnership with Women Food and Agriculture Network um, and many other folks who have been sort of doing grounded, participatory, um, non-hierarchical engagement with women and communities in this country and elsewhere um, with the whole idea of sort of like creating spaces that are safe for folks who tend to feel marginalized, in this case, women in kind of mainstream agricultural spaces and finding a way to get them financial and technical resources. Um, and so our sort of program was built around these learning circles um, that really, again, are this sort of peer learning um, and network building facilitator to get women connected to resources. Anything from when mostly women landowners, women farmers, more and more we're seeing women um, who want to become farmers uh, be a part of that mix. 
Um, the other piece that, um, so that's been sort of a central component of our work and we continue to both um, enliven that, but also to think about how can we expand beyond that to think about other kinds of way to, ways to engage women, continuing with this sort of philosophy that hierarchy and kind of top down sort of learning and sort of delivery of information is perhaps a model that is that time has passed. Um, and thinking about ways to fi help women uh, find out how much they know about something, how much their neighbors and other women in their community or perhaps across the country know, and then connect them to financial technical resources. We partnered a lot with USDA, soil and water conservation, um, land trusts, uh, the list goes on. Um, but as we sort of grow into ourselves, we're expanding kind of thinking about research, which is an area that sort of I'm, I deeply care about and I'm interested in how does research guide our programming and help us prioritize what's important. So what are the gaps? We've done a lot of research on men farmers here, a lot of on actually women smallholder farmers internationally, but we still don't necessarily understand what some of the barriers and potential kind of facilitators of women in ag success here in the US. Um, and then and then policy is an area that we're also growing into to both um, kind of facilitate folks getting more involved and the women that we engage with more involved in policy mm -hmm. issues, um, the, especially advancing things like farmland protection, farmland stewardship, um, promoting land access, equitable land access, all of those pieces, um, but also kind of helping women see themselves as leaders and hopefully kind of engaging for local change, whether that's sort of, you know, joining um, the Soil and Water Conservation District Board, or maybe that's running for public office, or maybe that's just organizing with fellow growers to you know, create some cooperative buying and selling power. Um, but the other piece, I guess I'd say that's sort of like the three stools, research, policy, outreach. Um, but the piece that I see us really growing into is what Kaylin started to sort of highlight uh, our sort of issues around equity um, and justice. And I think this is a place um, at American Farmland Trust that we are a majority white and and white led organization. And so we have a lot of room to grow and learn and humbly stumble in this space. Um, but I kind of, I was thinking about this last night that um, I kind of see us trying to figure out how do we kind of get out of the way and deliver and share resources more broadly with um, black indigenous, other folks of color um, to get access to resources that are disproportionately um, unavailable or systematically made unavailable to them. Since we know the story of white women is not the same as the story of say black women in terms of their access to resources, their ownership of land, um, their success on their farms. So there's all this sort of embedded pieces. So I do see us trying to build broader coalitions and deeper partnerships with communities of color. But to be honest, I also see a lot of the work um, of us just sort of confronting whiteness in our own organizations, in our circles, and asking questions among the many um, white women who we work with about sort of thinking about the land that we own, what is that land's purpose? How are we going to think about the next stage of succession planning or land access? And how can we, as a, as a white identifying woman, how can we kind of be in service of justice issues, even as we're talking with other white folks or thinking about sort of the legacy that has enabled us to sort of consolidate power in the form of land um, and wealth and capital and access to resources. So I think all these pieces are intersected. I'm interested in it. I'm also frankly like nervous because it's it's hard work, it's important work, and we have to learn how to get out of the way um, of ourselves and our white fragility and do the work. So, but I, I'm excited. Uh, so there's a lot and there's a lot more on the yeah. docket. I'll stop there. <laughs> well, I'm excited. I'm excited about your work, but I'm also excited that we're having some really good questions come in. So I wanted to just bring some of those to you. Um, so this is a question that we're getting from uh, Claire Givens, Gronk on Facebook. And um, so they want to know is AFT across the board, do we focus on any particular farm size, small, medium, large. Um, I, I could just talk from a, a macro level, not women for the land, but AFT supports farmers of all shapes, sizes, um, production methods, for what they grow. Um, our focus is really on keeping farmers on the land and making sure that uh, the land is not developed. Um, and so one of the best ways to do that is to help farmers be economically viable, regardless if they're small, medium, or large producers. And so just, just an overall frame of how AFT works and the type of people that we work. Um, and so Gabrielle and Kayla, and I don't know if you want to address this question from more of the, the women for the land perspective, perhaps. 
I mean, I think one thing to add, I guess, is just that, you know, we know from the the research that has been done about, you know, some of the statistics we know about gender and agriculture is that women, um, women, especially primary producers, tend to be uh, kind of in stewardship of smaller plots of land. So, you know, just by dint of kind of focusing on and targeting women, um, will probably tend to be working with um, smaller operations. Um, and, and, you know, to Greg's point, that does impact, um, you know, the economic uh, kind of margins that those farms are on. So, um, you know, I would say, like to Gabrielle's point earlier, you know, this is something that we're kind of shifting on, you know, as we sort of engage and broaden, um, you know, our audiences in different parts of the country, obviously the sizes of the operations vary. Um, but I would say, you know, just by kind of targeting women, those tend to be smaller operations. I might just add that um, one of the other pieces in the mix is sort of our work with non-operating landowners, which can be kind of a larger acreage mix. Um, we've done um, some national analyses and uh, survey work of non-operating landowners, actually both men and women, uh, but they tend to sort of own land, but then rent all of that land out to someone. And we, um, as the conservation kind of land production community has been interested in how do we facilitate more good sort of conservation and climate resilient work on rented lands. So there are sometimes barriers. So that kind of imp was an impetus for us to do this research. And so for some women who kind of own that land and rent it out, sometimes there's a quite a bit larger operations or women who are like co-principal operators. This last census enabled us to collect better data on those women. So often women uh, historically have been at the centerpiece of farms across the country, many different sizes, but many of them have not seen themselves as the farmer, but they've been doing the books for 30 years. So there's also been this sort of shift about like, who is the farmer or who who's included in that. So I think it's a complex mix. But, um, but I think, yeah, to Caitlin's point, we do see, you know, the women who are sort of running their own farms that tends to be and as well as sort of uh, farmers of color tend to be uh, the sort of what ERS calls like the under resourced farms um, and smaller in scale. But what we found in sort of the pandemic times is that some of these sort of smaller, more diversified farms were much better at pivoting to more kind of diverse production and getting food mm -hmm. in the hands of their communities in ways that larger production systems weren't. And some of them saw or captured some economic benefits as a result of that. Many folks just down the way here in the Willamette Valley, some of the women farmers I know uh, had an amazing year because everyone was looking out for their local food security. Yep. Um, and just to tell everyone that's submitting comments, thank you. We've got a ton coming in. If we don't answer them all on the call right now, we'll do our best to go into Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and answer them in the comment threads for you. Um, Gabrielle, you mentioned non-operating landowners. And so I wanted to mention that the, your research and the Women for the Land research actually uh, inspired a new bill to be introduced last week by uh, Rep. Julia Brownlee in California called the Conservation for Agricultural Lease Lands Act. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this bill, um, maybe why AFT supports it, but also kind of on a macro level, why engaging these individuals we call non-operating landowners is so important to um, implementing conservation at scale. Yeah, and I want to just give a shout out to like the many people who helped to collaborate on that research. So Peg, Dr. Peg Petrozelka, who's at Utah State, she was sort of the lead um, social scientist on the project. And it all kind of started before my time. So I got to sort of ride on the coattails of this of this great project and, and take some credit for it. But um, they um, and also Ann Sorensen, who was our previous research director. And then we had some great partnerships with the Nature Conservancy. Um, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service gave us some funds for it, as did the Nature Conservancy, as did Rachel's network. Um, hopefully I'm not forgetting anyone else, but wanted to just shout out there since it was a collaborative effort. And then just a lot of other researchers who've been doing work in this space um, and asking questions around non-operating landowners. So, um, and I'm so excited to see this attention being paid to rented land. And I, I think one of the like big sort of sea shifts here is that recognizing one that rented land is, you know, parts of the U.S. So it depends that sort of the percent of rented land is a little less than half in the U.S. But if you look at certain counties around the country, it's upwards of 80 percent. So we know it's highly um, important and the land ownership structure can be complicated. Some of it is more corporate and these large land holdings and trusts that we have looked at less closely than more of your traditional like, you know, 
a single person or couple who owns land. They, you know, they had a spouse pass away, a parent pass away, and they still own 300, 1,000 acres and they rent it out. So there's a lot of complexity in like what is rented land. Uh, but sorry, that's my like researcher in my in my head. But basically you recognize that there's so much important work to be done on this land. And so I think this bill is starting to sort of highlight how can we facilitate and intervene with um, facilitating um facilitating policy that's going to kind of support getting resources in the hand hands uh, in one case sort of these non-operating landowners since we know they disproportionately use um, resources to drive conservation so they often sort of look to their their farmer to do that work and so um, there's sort of this increased attention being paid to getting resources into their hands to help make some conservation decisions um, and we we try to put some pieces into um, our thoughts around this, around sort of making sure we're paying attention to sort of the unique needs of women knolls and male knolls. They tend to, if we, in our analysis, we found that there's actually kind of a difference between um, uh, the experience of farming among men and women knolls. And so, um, often men have more experience in the tractor. They grew up with their grandpa um, and women don't. And that means men in our sample tended to do more conservation. So anyways, sort of long story short, sort of like helping to drive the importance of conservation on rented lands, thinking about sort of the unique outreach needs of that community and then helping to facilitate better conversations and perhaps um, instituting sort of um, facilitating mechanisms like changing terms of terms of leases um, to kind of help support folks in adopting more conservation on rented lands to kind of share uh, the burden of risk across the renter and the farm or the farmland owner. But there's well, lots of bill that I probably can't speak to. So <laughs> well, yeah, let me let me redirect this to Caitlin, since she does a lot of work with women landowners who attend our learning circles across the country. Um, are there any special or specific barriers that, you know, women who may not have been involved in agriculture but have inherited it? Um, what, what are the special circumstances, the special support that these women might need? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's hard to generalize, but um, but I would say, you know, part of what Gabrielle was speaking to earlier, just around um, kind of women's really confidence in in terms of owning that this is something that they can delve into, that this is a space that they belong in. I would say, you know, that that sense of belonging is something that I feel like there's been a generational shift. Um, really towards that. Um, but some of the, you know, I think this, the population of non-operating landowners tends to be women of an older generation. And so, you know, these are women who remember um, when they, you know, uh, weren't able to get a credit card on their own, you know, within their lifetime, you know, that right. this is, that they they had a different experience um, of um, being, uh, you know, often the only woman in a space where these kinds of agricultural conversations are happening. And, you know, maybe they grew up with um, their their brother being taught the, the you know, hands-on skills on the farm and them being, you know, kind of like I was experiencing, like relegated to, uh, you know, a certain um, aspect of the operation. Um, so I, you know, some of what I've heard from, you know, women like Jean Okui in um, California, who's, you know, you know, now in her 80s and is an incredible go-getter and, you know, taking on these leadership positions um, with her local, you know, resource conservation district and um, a lot of these kind of, uh, you know, decision-making spaces now. She, you know, her story is one of many women that, you know, were kind of um, thrust into that role um, through tragedy or through circumstances, you know, on their farm that had, that sort of, you know, put her in and necessitated her to be in a leadership role. Um, and, you know, her personality is just that she is, um, you know, she has that tendency to be very confident and to speak up and be outspoken. Um, but I think for, you know, women who that's not their default, um, you know, it can be really, really challenging to, you know, work up the courage to go into a space where um, you are, you know, one of the singular women in, in the room. Um, and where you don't really know all the lingo that's being tossed around or something like that. Um, you know, I think having, you know, just a, a bit of moral support and kind of seeing that someone else is, is doing that, 
um, and, and hearing from how they've navigated some of those challenges. Um, at the same time, you know, I don't want to discount how savvy so many women are and that really, you know, one of the things we're trying to capture, I think, with our learning circles is um, elevating the ways that women have innovated and just made their own systems. You know, I think mm -hmm. this is something we've talked a lot about with our team in the Pacific Northwest that, you know, where in that part of the country, there's a really high percentage of um, women uh, farmers that are operating their own um, farms. And, um, you know, I think for many of them, they've had to carve out a very unique niche in terms of the, the markets that they sell in. Um, and they've, you know, really collaborated in a lot of different ways to create, um, you know, innovative systems, uh, you know, both in terms of the practices they implement and in terms of how they get it to consumers. So um, I think that, you know, as much as there's this challenge among an older generation to kind of um, break into the um, larger, you know, kind of conventional system and, you know, we need representation there, there's also this potential to be cultivating, you know, the ways that that women and, and farmers of color are creating their own mechanisms for, you know, um, reaching their vision in agriculture. And I think that there is an opportunity to kind of, um, you know, elevate and ensure that folks are aware of those kinds of innovations. Definitely. And just to remind everyone, we're still going to do your be our best to answer all your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, so one thing, Gabrielle, I wanted to ask you, um, this, is a this is a call and a conversation about the future of women in agriculture. So I was wondering just, you know, as the head of AFT's uh, Women for the Land Initiative, like what are, what are your hopes and dreams for, for the future of agriculture and, you know, women's role in it? What does it look like? What would you love to see? Um, it's a great question. Uh, and I love seeing all these like great, you know, lots of good community building happening and the comments that are coming through. Yeah. So I appreciate everyone's sort of collaboration here. Um, wow. Well, I won't give you the dissertation answer, but, yeah. um, you know, I think a couple of pieces that come to mind, I mean, think more broadly. So for a minute, sort of like zooming out of them, just sort of women in agriculture, thinking about the pieces that I know AFT really cares a lot about, but I think this sort of space around, how agriculture can be and is a partner in tackling the challenge of climate change, um, as well as sort of providing a lot of environmental and social benefits in terms of, you know, farms can have problems. We all know, you know, that for, we have probably audiences who are joining us who are, are sort of the farmer angle or folks who are environmentalists. And we know that there has been conflict, but there's also a lot of meeting ground around, often around soil health and the health of um, our waters and um, how do we sort of create systems that are more resilient in the face of more drought, more floods. Um, a great sort of local example here in the Northwest is this dry farming collaborative that has started up at Oregon State University has grown um, to many folks in the Northwest who are just basically doing uh, no irrigation during the summer months, which are quite dry here in the Northwest um, and adapting local varieties um, of plants that do well in that environment to respond to uh, that change and women are really leading the way in that research space and it's a very collaborative space between researchers extension and farmers. I raise that as sort of I think that that will continue to be the movement forward is sort of creative um, and innovative strategies to respond to this sort of specter of climate change that is going to impact all of us that already is impacting all of us, but to find those sort of places where we can meet together. Um, there's been a lot of conflict here in Oregon where I live around sort of like the environment versus and climate change legislation um, and folks who manage land and, and resources and agriculture and range land. And so I hope that my vision is that we continue to find sort of that space to come together see how our, many of our goals are not at cross purposes, but we can kind of find ways to be collaborators and innovators. And American Farmland Trust, um, Jen Morcusera just was the lead author um, on a, and Emily Bruner on our team just put out a nice piece about kind of how agriculture, um, some of the latest and greatest on the science of carbon soil um, sequestration and kind of what we know and what we don't know about how agriculture can be a tool in the toolbox to respond to climate change. So. That's one goal of mine is just to sort of all of us in that space. And then, you know, when we think about that as women, um, we know that women have been leading in the sort of regenerative agriculture space or the climate smart agricultural space, soil health, um, lots of different terms that we see tossed around there, but kind of this 
this idea that the land can both provide economic benefit, but also environmental benefit. And um, when you kind of follow the folks who are doing this work on the ground, what we see is that um, it, it has a ripple effect to communities. So the healthier sort of our farms and food systems are, and the less sort of, I would say, um, that enable kind of community development and rural um, connectivity, um, I think that's another big piece of this is how do we both like sort of allow and support agriculture, mm -hmm. farmland protection to be an engine of um, kind of co rural community growth and resurgence and maybe COVID as I just saw an article on New York Times about sort of what is this the end of cities, right? And I don't mm -hmm. think so, but I think maybe it is going to drive people out into the country how can we ensure that we're that's being done in a way to sort of support um, agriculture, to preserve farmland, to ensure environmental benefits? Um, and so I think those are like the big pieces. And then, you know, I kind of already spoke to this, but I think it's just important to mention again is that uh, a lot of the sort of the statistics that we throw out at the Women for the Land program, we talk a lot about the fact that women have been this incredibly powerful force and we're actually a huge force in agriculture, both in terms of owning land and farming land, but often what gets obscured in that is that it still is very white. And when we look at sort of white uh, land ownership, you know, across the country, it's like nine, over 98% of land is owned and farmed by white folks. Some states, um, women of color might be, you know, farm, you know, I think in North Carolina, it's over 5%, right? But that's sort of like a, a very different than the national average, and it's quite low. So I think we sort of have to think about how land access and land ownership sort of can both drive um, issues of justice and, and reparations, or it can sort of consolidate and facilitate power holding um, by white folks. Um, and I think as Caitlin spoke earlier, there's been a lot of reckoning with that this year for at least a lot of white people who are reckoning with it in a new way. Uh, but I think that in the context of our work, we have to continue to figure out how do we do a better job with that um, and facilitate the transition of resources, which are in land is an incredible resource and incredible form, form of power. I always love hearing Ebony Alexander at the Black Family Land Trust kind of talk about that, this sort of like this um, important uh, land, how important land is to sort of consolidate sort of that heritage and power among Black folks that she works with. I'm probably uh, not articulating that perfectly, but I think that's incredibly important for us to recognize um, how land plays a space in there. So I think all of those pieces are intersecting um, in terms of where we go forward. And some of those pieces we'll play a part in as Women for the Land and American Farmland Trust, but it's asked me to be aspirational. I'm also just thinking like, this is the direction I see that we need to go. And hopefully that we see that there's sort of this intersectionality that we recognize that sort of we have to work together and less across purposes and kind of see the way that these different pieces, inequity, climate disruption, food insecurity, how they're sort of layered together in ways that are feeding each other and perpetuating certain things, or they can be sort of opportunities for dismantling current systems that kind of hold us all back. So a lot, yeah. but that's kind of what I'm what I'm seeing from yeah. my point this morning. Well, and I want to pose the same question to Caitlin, um, you know, both as someone who works in the Women for the Land Initiative at AFT with Gabrielle, but also just as a woman that has worked in agriculture and that has a passion for building resilient food systems. Like, what are your hopes and dreams? What, what do you want the future of agriculture for women to look like? Yeah, it's a big question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I see just this huge opportunity to change the face of agriculture. We're going through this generational transition, um, you know, of, uh, you know, farmland changing hands um, for lack of a better <laughs> term. And I think there there's an enormous opportunity there to re-envision, um, you know, who can be at the helm and who, like what sorts of ideas and um, approaches can become the mainstream in our agricultural system. And um, I think there's, you know, so many traditions and cultures we we can be drawing from um, in a respectful manner. And I think that um, there's so many ways that women have been um, innovating in that way for, for years. And um, I think just enabling more collaboration and, and greater solidarity across different efforts. You know, I see we have a lot of partners in the field um, that are doing similar work that's kind of rooted in, in a particular community or 
um, you know, kind of with a particular target population or, or kind of angle on their work. And I just see so much potential for us to be, um, you know, kind of collaborating across those efforts and finding ways to um, occupy different niches in, in terms of the, the, you know, big picture that we're working towards and kind of come together around a common vision of ensuring that, you know, um, when we, we get to the other side of this generational um, shift, we're, we're seeing, you know, um, you know, a bit more equity built into this system and um, more resources flowing um, and, and distributed in um, a more equitable fashion. And I think that um, there's a lot of room for AFT to play a role in that in terms of, you know, the policy space that, you know, Gabrielle was speaking to earlier. And I think the research is critical to that as well to kind of um, help us understand, like, what are the gaps um, in, in knowledge and, um, and understanding so far? And, you know, it's, um, there's as much as there's been good work done in that area, there's um, a lot of room to grow. And um, so I'd love to see, you know, just more collaboration and kind of cohesion around those efforts. Absolutely. Um, so I think we're going to start wrapping up in a few minutes. Please, please, though, keep your questions coming. Like I said, if we don't get to them on the call, we're going to do our best to go into the platforms and answer them in the comment threads directly. Um, Gabrielle, do you have any any final thoughts? Um, anything you want to talk about in terms of what's coming for Women for the Land or just, you know, any any inspirational quotes or whatever you want to end on here? Uh, well, I think uh, the first would just be to encourage people to go to farmland.org and backslash women. So, and I'm sure you'll see it up there, but that's a way for you to kind of just dig into some of our resources, both in terms of upcoming learning circles. If you want to participate, um, we continue to sort of expand our geographic footprint uh, and the partnerships that we're building. So I'm really excited um, to see that happening. So um, and, and you can just kind of look at some of our research and our resources there. So really excited about um, kind of just how much growth and expansion we're doing as a program and learning that we're doing. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I think uh, inspirational quotes, I think really what I'm wrestling with this year um, and the piece that I'm really, really excited about is some work that we're doing, expanding our programming in um, the Southeast into North Carolina and Kentucky and and making some intentional inroads, working with um, African-American women farmers, doing it in partnership with others. Some um, shout out to Grace Summers, who's been working with us in North Carolina and Kentucky, um, helping build relationships and Ebony Alexander, who I mentioned earlier at the Black Family Land Trust and uh, Kentucky State University and, and others in this mix. And really it's very new to us. And I, I mentioned it only in the space of, um, I think this next year is about, is for me, personally and professionally learning to kind of help figure out how to facilitate resource sharing and getting into the hands of good works that are being done and how can we use our platform and our resources, financial, technical, um, intellectual, and research. Um, how do we sort of use that in in drive of the common good? And, and I, I'm going to, I want to figure out how to sort of step out of the way and make it be less about women for the land or less about AFT, although we're there and important, but how do we just make sure the good work continues to get done? And we know that, you know, I think there was a question that came through here about sort of like why women don't access resources as much um, as their male counterparts. And I think that answer, it's such a complex answer. Um, some of it is lack of awareness and some of it is sort of systematic, um, exclusion. Um, so there is real sexism and real racism that are also at play. And they're also just sort of lack of awareness, right? There's a whole flood of sort of the ways that these things intersect. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of continue to recognize that um, resources are needed everywhere and that those needs are really different and diverse. So um, just kind of learning to step out of the way and make sure that we can drive resources where they are most needed since there is so much progress has been made with supporting women in agriculture, but there is still a long way to go in terms of um, where we need to get to. So, yeah. all right, Caitlin, last last hot takes from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's just been really sitting with me from some of the feedback we heard this year um, is that we really can't underestimate the power of um, you know what we're doing to support. Um, women with just the level of kind of exhaustion they're facing. I mean, I think that question that you just answered, Gabrielle, around kind of 
you know, what's what are some of the reasons that go into why women aren't accessing resources um, and, and getting more support? Um, I think just the level of, um, you know, layers of work that women are managing, um, there's so much that that kind of is invisible and implicit in in the expectations that are placed on on women in agriculture. And, you know, Gabrielle, you probably remember a question we got in our session um, with Kentucky State about, you know, emotional labor and, you know, what kind of support, you know, we might be doing or resources we can recommend to to help women, you know, navigate the additional emotional labor that they do um, in their families and farms and their communities. And, you know, I think for women of color this year was an especially burdensome year for emotional labor. And I think that, you know, the as limited as our learning circles are in terms of what we can do to provide some kind of um, therapeutic, you know, uh, healing around that. I think it's a start and we shouldn't underestimate the power of that, um, especially in agriculture. You know, I think um, someone in the comments mentioned, you know, just the, the level of struggle that, you know, many folks are experiencing and the isolation has been really real this year. So, um, you know, I think that's something that, um, when when I look forward to our, our work and kind of recommitting to, you know, um, pulling women back together, uh, that that's something that I've been thinking a lot about is just how do we provide some of that that relief and support. Well, I, I just have to say to Caitlin and Gabrielle, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. I think it was a really good conversation. Um, for everyone who's watching right now and everyone who's going to watch this recording afterwards, I just really appreciate you being with us, all of the great questions. Um, throughout the next year, you know, we're going to have more of these conversations about different topics, you know, uh, how you can protect your farmland with some of our experts there, uh, climate, water, um, maybe even some of our regional programs in, in our offices across the country. So I'm really excited to do more of these. Um, really excited for everything that's in store in the year ahead for AFT and for all the farmers and ranchers across the country. Um, this has been a free range conversation with American Farmland Trust. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you soon.